All right, so we have talked about single random variables, we talked about pairs of random variables, we talked about vectors of random variables, and now it's time to shift gear to a different topic, which is estimation. But before we talk about estimation, let's talk about the thing that is going on big time right now, machine learning and all of its applications. What is the fundamental problem of machine learning? What do you want to do in a machine learning problem? You have data, and you want from this data to get to the missing part of the data, right? So for example, you have a black box system, you have inputs, outputs, and you want to describe, to characterize that black box system, right? This is always the problem of machine learning. That you have data and you want to deploy this data to know something that this data is telling, right? There are lots of things in this process. And as we talked about before, the heart of pretty much all the machine learning algorithms available is the gradient descent, various variants of the gradient descent, steepest descent, stochastic gradient descent. But they are all centralized around this, that from your data, you want to get to something missing. So the first step in order to have a discussion in that regard will be to look at estimation, okay? So there are two types of estimation we will talk about today and possibly a little bit next time, which is parameter estimation and random variable estimation. So for the parameter estimation case, you have samples, and you seek theory. For the random variable estimation case, you have theory and observation, and you seek variable. So let's talk about these two briefly, and then we will give an example that encompasses both of them. So for the parameter estimation, you have samples of your random variables. You have a lot of values from identical samples of your random variable, but you actually don't know something about the distribution of the random variable. You don't know the mean, you don't know the variance. There is something about this random variable that you don't know and you want to know. But you have samples of the random variables, so you will use the samples to know what you don't know. On the other hand, for random variable estimation, you know everything about the distribution, you know all the parameters, but you don't know the value of the random variable. You have an observation and you know the theory and you seek to get to the value of the random variable. Is the difference between the two types clear? Let's talk about an example that combines both of them that discusses both of them all together. Assume that you are dealing with some transmission system. And that transmission system is a modern 5G communication system or a multi-dimensional storage device or some advanced PCIe, some quite complicated system for you that you do not know how to mathematically model. But you have an actual device. So at the beginning, you can do like input-output testing. You run some inputs, you get the output in order to mathematically characterize that black box of a channel you had. In that case, you are doing parameter estimation. You seek the theory through some input-output running sequence, all right? But then once you have the theory, you are no longer the man who will be using it. You are the manufacturer. Now someone else will use it, the user will, but for the user, the user doesn't, at the receiving end, for the user usage, he doesn't really know or she doesn't really know what was transmitted. So in that case, the receiving end, the receiver, it knows the theory, it knows the fundamentals of the channel you estimated in the first stage, and it has observation about what was transmitted, and it seeks to decide what was transmitted. In the first phase, you are training it. You know what was transmitted. You know the input, you know the output. In the second phase, the receiver doesn't know. Right? And the receiver seeks to estimate 
what happens first. So that, that could be a good example that combines both parameter estimation and random variable estimation. Everyone is okay? All right, so let's talk about parameter estimation. So consider random variable x with unknown distribution. Unknown parameter theta in particular, unknown parameter theta, and assume you have a random sample characterized by the vector xn of your random variable that has x1, x2, dot, 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 up to xn with iid versions of x. An estimator of the parameter theta is theta hat of xn equals g x1 x2 dot 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 up to xn and it is sometimes referred to as theta hat n. So this is the problem setup which is exactly what we discussed here. You have a random variable x with unknown parameter about its distribution. That parameter can be anything, can be the mean, can be the variance, can be something else about the distribution. And you have the luxury that you can sample it as many times as n times with IID versions. They are versions of your random variable. And you want to create an estimator of your random variable, theta hat of xn, of xn here, the vector, not xn, the last variable, which is function of all of them and can be referred to as theta hat n, where n is the number of samples, is the number of IID versions you have in your sample. All right? Evaluating an estimator. First, estimator bias. B of theta hat, which is the expected value of theta hat minus theta. So for unbiased estimator, you could anticip anticipate that B of theta hat is zero, leading to E of theta hat equals theta. Two, consistency of the estimator. And here, the condition is limit as n goes to infinity, the probability of the absolute value theta hat minus theta greater than epsilon is zero for a consistent estimator. All right, let's talk about these two. Estimator bias is something that is function of theta hat. It's just the expected value of theta hat minus theta. Remember that theta hat is not itself an expectation. Theta hat itself is just a function of the random variable, function. If you have n random variables, you can have their average. You can multiply them, you can take their minimum, whatever, it's just a function. And the expected value of theta hat is the expected value of this function of these random variables. So B of theta hat is the expected value of theta hat minus theta. So for an unbiased estimator, this got to be zero, i.e. the expected value of your estimator is the parameter you are seeking to estimate. Okay? For consistency, the condition of a consistent estimator is that limit as n goes to infinity, the probability absolute value theta hat minus theta greater than epsilon is zero. What is this? Just convergence in probability, right? Remember what we did in the law of large numbers last time? This is just convergence in probability. So convergence in probability. And by the way, this formula in general is pretty much a standard conversion formula, right? Like 
even conversions of series, conversions of sequences. Normally, people check conditions like this, that the absolute value of xn minus x0 is less than or equal to epsilon for every n greater than n. It's just the standard way of, of doing that for each n, that for each epsilon, there is n. All right? Okay. Now that we discussed the estimator bias, we discussed the estimator consistency, can someone tell me logically, given what we just discussed, what the estimator consistent consistency means, like in an intuitive fashion? Well, the estimated parameter uh, as a sum of space degrees of k is closer to the Thank you. Real exactly. So a consistent estimator, it gets better as long as you are taking more samples. Exactly. That's a consistent estimator. All right? There are two questions in your notes we will not deal with right now, but let's give a simple example first, and that simple example is the sample mean. So again, you have x1, x2, dot, 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 xn, iid, rvs, where e of x is mu, v of x is sig sigma squared, you want to find the expected value of mn, the variance of mn, and you want to evaluate the estimator mn of the mean mu. What is mn? mn is just the sample mean. We did it before. mn equals 1 over n summation from i equals 1 to n xi. That is something we discussed. And in fact, we give an example on for the sum of independent Bernoulli trials. So that's not something new. So we can just like do it very quickly. And then we start discussing something based on it. So let's do the expectation. The expected value of mn is 1 over n summation from i. Let's do it just one step before that. The expected value of summation from i equals 1 to n xi. What is this? Exactly, n times mu. Like on two steps, it's 1 over n summation from i equals 1 to n the expected value of xi equals, as our friend said, 1 over n, n times mu equals mu. The expected value, sorry, the variance of this parameter estimator nn is also immediately 1 over n squared variance of the summation. What is this? What's up? Okay, here it's unconditional, all right? Whether they are dependent, independent, it doesn't matter. Here, his answer is correct only because they are. In general, can you make variance of summation equal summation of variances in general? No, it's summation of variances plus summation of covariances. But here they are independent, which implies that they are uncorrelated, which means you can do it here, right? So it's 1 over n squared, summation from i equals 1 to n, the variance of xi, which is 1 over n squared, as our friend said, n sigma squared, which is sigma squared over n. All right, now, the expected value of mn equals mu. What does that imply about the estimator mn with respect to mu? Exactly, it's an unbiased estimator. Unbiased estimator. And we also have limit as n tends to infinity, mn equals mu. What is this implying about the estimator? Consistent estimator as well, thank you consistent estimator. One last question for you. Why is this correct? Oh, 
Why is this correct? Yeah, what is this called? Correct, you are right. What is this called? Yes, thank you. Thank you both. This is correct by the law of large numbers. Okay? Without any assumption about the random variables, this is correct by the law of large numbers. All right, awesome. Now, let's do the two questions. So the first one and the second one. Is an unbiased estimator always consistent? Is, is a consistent estimator always unbiased? Let's think about the first question first. Is an unbiased estimator always consistent? And you will answer these questions. If we'll stay until the end of the life, you will answer. <laughs> okay? Is an unbiased estimator always consistent? How many say yes? How many say no? Okay, good. Okay. For those who say no, do you have an intuition why? These two questions are very important. So I think uh, they are not dependent on each other. The consistency uh, about the sample space and our number of samples, but the uh, biasing thing, the average of uh, estimation, not the random variables, uh, in all our space. Yeah. Do you agree with him? Yeah. So. The answer is no. They are right. The answer is no. Let's give a simple example in that regard. Let's do the following estimator. Theta hat equals xi for the expected value of x. Is this estimator unbiased? Just let's do the expectation, right? This estimator is definitely unbiased. How about the consistency of this estimator? Does this estimator get better when you increase the sample? It just goes on to one xi and takes it. So, of course, it's not getting better as you increase the sample. The idea, fundamental idea here is, if you think about even a distribution like a Bernoulli half, its expectation is a half. When you take any sample out of n, it will give you a value either a zero or a one. So this particular estimator, in fact, will never give you the value you are seeking. Like, ever. <laughs> it doesn't really matter how many samples you take because it's independent on the sample. So this one is unbiased, inconsistent. And why is that? As our friend said, because consistency depends on the fact that the estimator gets better when you increase the number of samples. Being unbiased just depends on the expectation. As a matter of fact, this estimator is terrible. It's a very bad estimator. Right? Okay. Now, how about the second question? Is a consistent estimator always unbiased? How many say yes? How many say no? So you would say no for the same reason. So yeah, and again, this answer is correct, so no. Remember that here the question is not about the quality of the estimator. This is a different story. So a consistent estimator is typically a quality estimator, even if it is biased. 
let's give an example in that regard. If you have this estimator, 1 over n summation from i equals 1 to n x i plus 1 over n. And also this is for e of x. Is this estimator unbiased? Is this estimator unbiased? It has a 1 over n bias that never goes away. You take n equals 1 billion, still has some bias. It will never go away. Is it consistent? Yes, of course, because even its bias, it will eventually go to zero as n goes to infinity. So this estimator is biased but consistent. And in general, this is not a bad estimator, right? Because you would expect to take n being large, and thus, eventually, this theta hat will get to the parameter you are trying to estimate. OK? Everybody's OK until now? OK. Let's do a harder example than the one we did. So example two. So x uniformly distributed. in the interval 0 to a, a is unknown, and then you have x1, x2, dot, 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 xn being iid versions of x, you decide to use the estimator y n equals max of x1, x2, dot, 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 x n. And then you have some questions. The first one is to find the CDFFYN of y, then to find the expected value of y n, the variance of y n, and also Finally, to evaluate the estimator yn. Is the problem statement and the idea of the problem clear? So you have x uniform in 0 to a. You are trying to estimate the upper bound, OK? The upper bound of a. That's what you are trying to estimate. This time, you are not trying to estimate mean. You are not trying to estimate variance. It's something else in the distribution, which is A. You have IID versions. You decide to use this estimator, which is the maximum of them. You want to find the CDF expected value variance and evaluate this estimator. All right? OK. So let's first try to solve A. Fyn of y, we did similar things multiple times before. Probability yn less than or equal to y is the probability that the maximum of x1, x2, dot, 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 xn less than or equal to y. How to deal with this? How to deal with the maximum? This is the idea, right? This is the idea to deal with the maximum always. OK? If your ceiling of a set of random variable is less than some value, all the rest are less than the same value. OK? So this tends up to be the probability that x1 less than or equal to y, the probability that x2 less than or equal to y, dot, 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 the probability that xn less than or equal to y. Why did I make a multiplication? Thank you. It is because they are independent, and this ends up being f x of y to the power of n. OK? What is f x of y to the power of n? This one we can immediately do, because it's uniform, y over a to the n in the interval 0 less than or equal to y less than or equal to a. From where this division came, what is this? 
right? Until now, everything is clear? OK, great. So there are situations where actually it could be easier to get to the expected value and the variance throughout the distribution. Not every single case, because we have seen cases where recursion helps more and you got to avoid trying to seek the underlying distribution. But this is not a similar case. In this particular case, yeah, the CDF is easy. You can get the PDF easily. You can get the expectation from the PDF. How to get the PDF? How to get the PDF? Yeah, we have the CDF, we just differentiate it. So D F Y N of Y by DY, which ends up being immediately N over A to the N, Y to the N minus one, zero less than or equal to Y, less than or equal to A. How to get the expectation? Now we have the PDF, how to get the expectation? Yeah, exactly. So it's integration from y equals 0 to a, y, f, y, n of y, dy, integration from y equals 0 to a. You just multiply this by y, n over a to the n, y to the n dy. This is a very easy integral, so I will do the final answer immediately. It becomes n over n plus 1 times a. How about the expected value of y n squared? You just replace this by y squared. It's not much here. y squared f y n of y dy, which is the integration from y equals 0 to a n over a to the n y n plus 1 dy, which is n over n plus 2 a square. All right, what is the variance then? This guy minus this guy squared, right? Expected value of y n squared minus expected value of y n overall squared. That ends up being n over n plus 2, m plus 1 squared, a squared. The evaluation of the estimator is the expected value of y n equals the expected value of a hat, where a hat is your estimator, equals a. Is this correct? No. It ended up being biased. Thank you. So biased estimator. However, however, what is the limit as n goes to infinity e of y n? This is the limit as n goes to infinity, n over 1 plus 1 over n, 1, sorry, over 1 plus 1 over n, a. What is this? A. Right? So as n goes to infinity, this becomes a. How about limit? As n goes to infinity, the variance of y n, limit as n goes to infinity. Can someone tell me the order of this numerator? The order, it's n, right? The order with respect to n, right? How about the order of this? Exactly, right? So it's order one, order, oh, you said you meant one as the power. Okay, this is also correct. So order n divided by order n cubed times a squared. What is this? This goes to zero very quickly, very quickly like with 1 over n square order, all right? 
What is this telling us about the quality of the estimator? Is this a good estimator? Okay, as n goes to infinity, what we came to realize is that this random variable, which is the estimator, tends up to be a variable with expected value being a and variance being zero. What is the random variable that has zero variance? Exactly, thank you. So as n goes to infinity, our estimator y hat tends up to be constant equals a. So this is a good estimator of a. Observe that checking the consistency can be done in multiple ways. One of the ways is to immediately try to get limit as n goes to infinity y n, your estimator. But in this case, it's just a maximum. That's not an easy thing to deal with. It was easy in other examples we did here. It's not easy. Another way is exactly what we did here. To check the impact on the expected value and more importantly, the variance as n goes to infinity. Because still, if the expected value would have been A and the variance is very big, this still would have been a bad estimator, right? But not in this case, okay? Okay, now we will do something different and um, a little harder. So try to give me your full attention. random variable estimation. <coughs> the minimum mean square error linear estimator. All right, again, what is the problem setup? So we want to estimate x via some function g of y equals x hat, y is the observation. Again, this is the setup we just discussed. We have the theory. We know the distribution of A. We know all its parameters. We have an observation about x, sorry, x not a. We have an observation about x. This observation is y. We want a function of y that brings us as close as we can get to x, okay? So x hat is function of y. y is the observation. x is the random variable you want to estimate its value. Can someone give me an example on this that we did together and you did on the homework? that you have an observation about something, you want to estimate its original value. Thank you very much. It's that question, right? The wireless communication transmission, right? You have Y, observation about X, and you want to use Y to estimate X. Right? So you did something like that before, okay? But here we are talking about the case of linear estimation and we will try to build the knowledge step by step. Okay, what is the idea of any mean square error estimator? What's the idea of this thing? Have, how many of you have seen something like this before? So what is the fundamental idea of this? Your error, your error function, if we can say, this is the expectation of x minus x hat squared, which is the expectation of x minus g of y squared. Before any extended discussion, does that make sense to you? The standard error is x minus x hat. You square it, you try to minimize the expected value of it. Okay? This is the error function. Okay? x minus x hat squared 
and under the expectation. So that is what we are trying to do. We are a successful and optimal mean square error estimator minimizes this quantity, okay? And since we started to take about minimization, this could tell you that why this is the first step we take towards doing optimization, because this is the fundamental idea of optimization. And this could also tell you why we are doing optimization, because that's how machine learning works. You want the optimal set of parameters that could minimize the error on what you are trying to learn. All right? Everything is clear? Bigger picture? Go ahead. Why do we have the square? Because you don't, you don't want like the plus errors to cancel the minus errors. You want just to look at the absolute value, so you square it and operate on it, all right? So now, this is our error. Let's do two cases, case one. Case one is that our estimator x hat equals g of y is not really a function of y, it is just a. So we decide that our estimator is simply just a. This is the function we are doing. This is our mean square error estimator, our MIMSI estimator. First of all, before we do the math, is, is this in general a good estimation? I mean, you pick some constant value, so I mean, that's not the best idea, but we're just, again, we're trying to build it step by step. Okay, so E in this case is the expected value of X minus A squared. So E is the expected value of x squared minus 2a, the expected value of x plus a squared. We want to find a star, which is the a that minimizes the error. How to find the a star? Right? Differentiate, equate to zero. This is what you always do for minimization or maximization, right? So, partial E by partial A at A equals A star equals zero, and thus minus two, the expected value of X plus two A at A equals A star equals zero, and thus A star equals the expected value of X. Forget about whether this is a good estimator or not because we know this is a bad MIMSI estimator. That's not the best you could do. But given that, you will do a constant. Doesn't that make sense? What is the only thing you could do with a constant, right? It's the expected value. That's the best thing you could do with a constant, right? So even before doing the math, we could see that the end result should be something like this, right? That's a constant. The only thing you could do with a constant is the expectation, right? The variance is, is not, you cannot relate the variance to a constant. It's not going to help much, right? Okay, now let's try to do a harder case, case two. And in that case, we are trying to do g of y, our x hat is a y plus b. Okay? So our MIMSI estimator here was a constant, here it's a linear function of y. What do we seek to get here? We seek to get A star and B star. Again, our error is the expected value of, in this case, x minus ay minus b squared. Let's try to look at this thing and try to think of what could B star be immediately. If we could name this new random variable Z, and then we are seeking expected value of Z minus B squared, what would B star be? <coughs> Who is talking? Exactly, right? We just did it. It's going to be the expected value of z. We just did it here, right? So this is going to be the expected value of z. 
which is the expected value of x minus a, the expected value of y. Okay? It's an easier problem now. We have everything being set up to search for a star alone. Once we search for a star, we know b star. All right, so e in this case is going to be the expected value of x minus a y minus e of x minus a e of y overall square. Just some mathematical arrangement to get x minus e of x minus a y minus e of y overall square and we close the brackets until now do you have any problem how to differentiate this so we want par partial e by partial a at a equals a star to be zero how can we differentiate this You have a big function with respect to a, right? You take the power down and differentiate what's inside, right? So this will end up being the expected value of, again, x minus e of x minus, so you have minus 2 here, minus a y minus e of y, multiplied from the outside by y minus e of y, equals zero. Forget about the minus 2e. So that's what you eventually have. Okay. When y minus e of y gets multiplied by x minus e of x under the expectation, what is this? Covariance. Thank you, right? Covariance. How about these two? Variance, right? Everybody agrees? So A star is covariance of xy divided by variance of y equals rho xy times sigma x sig over sigma y. And thus, the final answer for our g of y, the optimal one, which is x hat, is rho xy sigma x over sigma y, y minus e of y plus e of x. All right. The most important stuff about the MEMSI estimator is the stuff I will say now, not the stuff we did. Do you have any problem with the math? Okay. Two things. Two things. Number one. Let's look at this relation. When you have something like this, expected value of f1 of x times f2 of x is zero. What is this implying about f1 of x and f2 of x? What's up? Yes, yes, orthogonal. Yeah, 100%, thank you. This implies that they are orthogonal. This implies that they are orthogonal. Okay, so we have this weird long function multiplied by another short function and their expectation is zero. So we know that this one and this one are orthogonal. This one is the observation. Just a zero mean version of the observation, right? What is this? Don't, don't, don't be just like scared about this too many terms you have. This and this and this all together, all together are x hat, right? After making the substitution of b. So this, this and this are x hat. Those together are x hat with a minus sign, right? So what is this guy? This guy is the error. What is this guy? This is the observation. What is this telling us? It is telling us that the error is orthogonal to the observation. 
every single optimal MIMSI is having this property. Every single optimal MIMSI estimator has the error being orthogonal to the observation. Every single one of them. So, if your error is in this plane, your observation is here. The easiest check about your optimal MIMSI estimator, your MIMSI estimator you are trying to derive, the easiest check is that you immediately do that check. Are they orthogonal or not? If they are, that's an optimal MIMSI. If they are not, you made a mistake. All right? Error and observation are orthogonal. The last thing is, let's, let's look at this. Let's have a deeper look at this thing. Okay? Again, what are we trying to do? We want to get an optimal MIMSI estimator through a linear function based on the observation. That's what we are trying to do. If you forget about rho xy and sigma x and sigma y, well, even if you don't forget about them, what is the expected value of this thing altogether, this first term altogether? This term, what is the expected value of this term? Just enter the expectation here, right? There is, it's not that hard. Enter the expectation here. What's the expected value of this term? What? Yeah, zero, absolutely, right? So what is the expected value of this x hat? Aha, uh -huh. its expected value is the expectation of x. There is some consistency happening with what we did here though, right? So expected value of x hat is expected value of x. And that's what you want. That is something you want to have. That is something you need to have. Okay. Now, let's, let's forget about rho xy and sigma x. What do you have here? y minus e of y over sigma y. What is the variance of these three terms? y minus e of y over sigma y. If you create a random variable that is y minus e of y over sigma y, what will its variance be? No, not zero. But instead of zero, it's like the standard Gaussian trick we do, right? So what is the variance of this? One, right? It's just like this is a constant. Forget about the constant. You are dividing by sigma y. The variance of this thing is one, OK? So after you scale, the variance without the correlation coefficient is sigma x squared, right? And the correlation coefficient is the parameter you will play with to tune your estimator. So the expected value of your estimator is e of x. The variance of your estimator without rho xy is sigma x squared. And rho xy is the parameter that tunes your estimator. All right? So this math, when you understand what is beneath it, it, it makes a lot of sense. It becomes more beautiful. Is everything clear? All right, great. I will see you next week.